Father God, we pray against any disaster this morning. We pray, Lord, that, uh, that we would experience uh, the presence of your Spirit as your Word is proclaimed, moving in us and through us, Lord, enabling us to not only receive your truth, but to understand it and to incorporate it uh, into the lives that you've called us to live. And so, Father, we pray that your word going out with power uh, this morning would accomplish uh, everything that you have uh, meant it to accomplish. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ross, you're going to need to sit back at the computer. I'm going to need you to do something in a minute. Uh, this morning, we're continuing our sermon series, Restoring the Masterpiece. And you might remember a few weeks ago when we looked at the topic of fear, uh, I spoke briefly about Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. And I want to draw your attention to a detail, just a very small detail uh, from the ceiling of, uh, of the Sistine Chapel. If you just clear the words, Ross, there you go, perfect. Um, this is the graphic for our sermon series, and so it's on the front of the bulletin, and, and here it is on the screen. Uh, just as a reminder, the Sistine Chapel was painted by Michelangelo between 1508 and 1512. And uh, the fresco depicts humanity's need for salvation as offered by God through Christ. And the main component of the ceiling depicts nine scenes from the book of Genesis, uh, building up, of course, to the fall and to the need for salvation. But at either end of the wall and beneath are pictures of 12 men and women, uh, prophets and sibyls. A sibyl is another word for a female prophet. Uh, men and women who prophesied the birth of Jesus. And this picture here on the screen is a detail of what uh, art historians have called the Libyan sibyl the Libyan Sibyl. And although it's only a small part of this overall grand design, uh, it is nonetheless extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, Vasare, the ancient art historian, writes about this, this woman. He says, many aspects of this figure are of exceptional loveliness. The expression of her face, her headdress and the arrangement of her draperies, her arms, which are bared and are as beautiful as the rest. Now, the sad thing is, over time, this exceptional loveliness has been damaged. It's been damaged due to exposure to the world. And so water and salt leaks in the ceiling and dirt and soot caused by burning oil and, and animal fat candles for over 500 years They've caused not only the Libyan Sibyl here, but the entire Sistine Chapel ceiling to crack, to bubble, to flake away, and to fade. And, and although there were some efforts to restore the chapel ceiling to its original beauty in the 17th and, and 18th centuries, it wasn't until, until the 1980s and the 1990s that any major restoration work was undertaken. And this picture here is incredible because it shows the stages of restoration of the Libyan Sibyl. So the top left is what they started with, and you can see how it was damaged just by exposure to the world. And it shows how the dirt and grime are carefully removed with distilled water, and how the uh, picture is touched up with new paint. And it's really incredible what an art historian or a conservationist uh, can accomplish, isn't it? Now, if you think about it, and I've said this every week now, like the Sistine Chapel, like the, the Libyan Sibyl, we are God's masterpiece. You and I are God's best work. Each one of us unique. Each one of us individually created and individually loved by God. Thanks, Ross. And because of that, because we are created in his image and we're loved by him, we're of infinite value and we are of infinite worth. But sadly, like the Sistine Chapel, like the Libyan Sibyl, we too can become damaged due to exposure to the world. We can look like the top left of that picture. We can become dull and washed out and dirty. We can lose our luster and our vibrancy. And, and as such, we too are in constant need of restoration and repair. 
And so, for the past few weeks, we've been looking at those things in our lives that can damage the masterpiece. Things like anger and fear and shame. And we've been looking at how the Holy Spirit works, restoring and cleaning and repairing us from the inside out in order to preserve and enhance God's original intent for us, in order to get us from the top left to the bottom right. And just like the Libyan Sibyl, you can see it's a process. It's a process within us. Now this morning I want to look at something that we have all struggled with and we have all been damaged by at some point in our lives. And although I couldn't think of one word to describe it, I think it's summed up in Paul's frustrated cry in our reading this morning from the book of Romans that Barb read for us. Paul says, why do I do the things I don't want to do? Why do I do the things I don't want to do? I suspect that we can all relate to Paul's question, let alone Paul's frustration. Because we have all struggled with destructive behaviors, negative thought patterns, character flaws in our lives. Things that hurt us and things that hurt our relationships. Things that destroy the masterpiece, that keep us from becoming all that God created us to be. We all know what it feels like to do things we don't want to do and to not do the things we want to do. So to help us address Paul's question, to help us get a better understanding of of how this dynamic works in our lives, I want to do a couple things. I want to look, first of all, at what the problem is. And then I want to look at what God's promise is in the midst of that problem. And I want to look at what his prescription is for change. So that hopefully, by his power, we can do more of the things that we want to do and less of what we don't want to do. So let's start with the problem. Why is it that we don't do what we want to do? Why is it that we do the things we don't want to do? In other words, why do we have such a hard time getting our act together. Paul, I think, sheds some light on this in our reading this morning. He says in verse 15, I don't understand myself at all. I'm using the New Living Translation here. I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. But I can't help myself because it is sin inside me that makes me do these evil things. I know I am rotten so far as my old sinful nature is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. I mean, you can almost feel the pain and the frustration and the hopelessness here in Paul's voice, can't you? No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. Can you relate to this at all? I can. I mean, Paul is clear here. Barbara read it for us. Whether we realize it or not, whether we agree with it or not, whether we accept it or not, there is a war going on inside of each one of us. A war between right and wrong. A war between light and dark. A war between good and evil. A war between flesh and spirit. And speaking about this war, speaking about this problem, Jesus says very clearly in Matthew 26, 41, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And sadly, that can be the motto of my life sometimes. The spirit is willing. It's the flesh that's weak. This tension within us is part of our human nature, our fallen human nature. In fact, I suspect we're most aware of this battle when we try to do something about it, when we try to quit a bad habit, 
Right? Sure, we may have some success for a little while, but over time, we're right back at it. Right? Can anyone relate to that? You say, I want to change, but I just can't. And you feel as frustrated and as helpless as Paul in our reading. How many of you made New Year's resolutions this year? For those of you who did, are you still keeping them? I mean, it's almost March. If you are, congratulations. If you're not, you're probably not alone. Right? Whether we've made New Year's resolutions or not, I'm sure we all know what it's like to try to stop doing something, right? A bad habit, uh, a thought pattern, maybe a, an addiction, or we try to change something about ourselves to, to improve ourselves or better ourselves, and we fail miserably. And the reason for this is really simple. Good intentions are not good enough. Right? Good intentions are not good enough. It takes a lot more than just desire to change. I'll never lose my temper again. I'll never indulge myself again. I'll never smoke another cigarette. I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. I mean, whatever. Sentiments like these may be heartfelt at the time. They may be heartfelt in the moment, but they often lack the power over the long term to have any lasting effect on our lives. And why is that? I suspect it's because the desire to do something is often stronger than the desire not to do something. Let me say that again. The desire to do something is often stronger than the desire not to do something, especially during times of stress or when we're feeling weak or unwell or out of control. That's when we turn to those, those comforts. Now, Paul, in the reading this morning, lists three symptoms of this inner battle in, our, in, in the reading. The first symptom is confusion. Paul says, I don't understand myself. Have you ever wondered why you act in ways that don't make sense? Have you ever wondered, you know, why do I keep making the same mistake over and over again? Why do I keep making this bad choice over and over again? I know this is wrong, but I keep doing it. Why can't I stop? I just don't understand myself. Friends, that's confusion. Symptom number two, Paul says, is frustration. Frustration. Paul says, I have the desire to do good, but not the power. And indeed, you can see his frustration in the whole passage this morning. How many times have you started a new day or a new week with great intentions? Right? Today is going to be different. I'm, I'm not going to do this, or, or I am going to do this. But by the evening or by the end of the week, nothing's changed. How many diets have started in the morning and by the end of the day, you're enjoying a balanced meal, a Big Mac in both hands, <laughs> right? Or you can only manage to go two hours before you break down and you're standing outside in the snowstorm with your friends from work huddled together smoking your cigarette. You could only go two hours. Or whatever it might be for you. I mean, fill in your own poison. Fill in your own temptation. It's frustrating, isn't it? You want to change, but you can't. You have a desire to do good, but not the power. Remember what Jesus says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There are thousands, thousands of self-help books published every year on every possible topic. And why do you think that is? Because there is a market for it. Right? People are always looking for the latest tip, the hottest idea, therapy, fad, whatever, that will instantly change them or improve some aspect of their lives. 
right? Constantly looking for the quick fix, the fairy godmother with the magic wand, so to speak. But the problem is, the problem with self-help books, uh, motivational speakers, and and so-called life-changing seminars and conferences is that even though they may offer us some good ideas, right, even though they may have some insight into the problem, they don't give us the power that we need to change. So they say things like, well, if you want to live a fuller life, just drop all your bad habits. You know, stop being negative. Start being more disciplined. That's great, but how? And the older you get, the harder it is to change. The harder it is to go in there and rewire. So this leads to the third symptom, and that is discouragement. It's like Paul throws up his arms as he's dictating to the scribe, and he says, Oh, what a wretched man I am. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? If Paul was speaking today, he may say, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. I'm ready to give up. My life's a mess. Why even try? I'll never change. That's discouragement. Maybe some of you are experiencing this right now in some area of your life. Maybe you're losing the battle and you feel like giving up. Well, if so, I have good news. There is a way out. There is a way forward. We do not have to be controlled by destructive behaviors, negative thought patterns, and character flaws. There's hope for change, and we can experience victory in our lives. Right? The victory that Christ offers us isn't just a future victory when we die. Right? He wants us to live in his resurrection victory today. So this brings us to the promise. Jesus says in John 8, 32, he says, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, he says, for the Lord is the spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And these two things go hand in hand, truth and freedom. God promises us freedom when we know his truth. And unlike us, God always keeps his promises. And I break promises all the time, sadly, but God doesn't. God is faithful to his word. And so the secret to transformation and the secret to living that resurrection victory in our lives cannot be found in a book. It cannot be found at a conference or a seminar or a retreat. The secret to transformation and victory in our lives is not sheer willpower. It's not a pill, a resolution, or an inner vow that we might make. I will never. The secret to transformation and victory isn't something that we do or say at all because it's not about us. The secret to transformation and victory in our lives is Jesus and his truth. Right? Jesus is the answer. When we seek to change the way we think, it begins to change the way we feel And when we change the way we feel, it changes the way we act. Without God's truth, without God's Holy Spirit, we are powerless to change. Paul puts it this way, I think, in Romans 12, verse 2. He says to us, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, I like, I like how the message translation renders this verse. 
It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. I like that. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Regardless of what version of the Bible we want to use here, I think Paul is clear and consistent. We need to allow God to change the way we think. We need our minds to be renewed. We need to let God's truth, with a capital T, and God's Spirit rule in our hearts and rule in our minds and rule in our lives, and then we will know and experience His power to change. We can't get this from a book. We can only get it from God. And God's truth shows us that behind every self-defeating act, behind every self-defeating act is a lie that I'm believing about myself. It may be a lie about myself or my life. It, It may be a lie about who God is. Uh, It may be a lie about the nature of success or failure, what that looks like. It may be a lie about the past, the present, or the future. And some of these lies we picked up as children. And others we got from the culture and from the media. Some of these lies were thrust on us by by other people, by parents, teachers, ex-spouses. Others we creatively thought up all on our own. And some of these lies came from the enemy, who the Bible calls the father of lies, who loves to deceive us, who loves to kill, steal, and destroy, as John 10.10 tells us, who loves to keep us in bondage. Now, whatever it is, it is an ungodly belief that is not true, Right? It's a belief that I have either consciously or unconsciously accepted and allowed to have control in my life, the way I think, the way I speak and act, the way I view myself, the way I view other people, the way I relate in community. And in turn, these lies, and in my effort to, to control them, they breed destructive behaviors, negative thought patterns, and character flaws. Notice Jesus doesn't say here, when you speak the truth, or when you do the truth. He says, when you know the truth. Transformation always starts in our mind. We have to expose and uncover the lies that we've accepted and focus on the truth. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to be brave. I'm going to ask you to face the truth. The truth about yourself and the truth about your problems. And most importantly, though, the truth about God. As we look at the prescription for the problem. Four steps that I think we can take to better position ourselves, at least, to experience this transformation and victory in our lives that God wants to give us. God's your biggest fan. So step number one, acknowledge the root of your problem. Acknowledge the root of your problem. Many people go through life with a vague sense or feeling that there's something wrong, a dis-ease. But they can't quite put their finger on it. They don't know what it is. Or they haven't been open to the truth, to hearing what it is. But the great news here is God knows exactly what it is. God knows what's wrong with you. God knows what's wrong with me. We have an attitude problem. And God has a word for that problem. Now, that word isn't popular in our culture, and to be honest, it's it's not popular in certain parts of the church either. But the word is sin, and that's our problem. 
Paul says in verse 17 of our reading this morning, So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Now, Paul's not, you know, standing back saying, it's not my fault, it's sin. That's not what he's doing here. He's acknowledging the sin that is within him and the role that it plays in this inner battle. Sin starts in the mind. And it affects our thoughts. And it then produces sinful behavior. And so we sin when we try to play God. We sin when we think we know better than God. When we do what we want to do instead of what God wants us to do. We sin when we ignore God and we say, well, I'm not going to listen, Lord. I'm going to do what I think is right here. Because I need to control this situation because I need to have my own way. What makes it worse is that we can live in a state of denial about our sinfulness. We can see everyone else's problems and everyone else's sin, but we're blinded to our own. We have these euphemisms, like, well, I'm not perfect, it's, it's just how I am, or my father was this way, or my mother was this way. But what we rarely say, what we rarely admit is, I've got a sinful nature that leads me to want to do this. Whatever it is for you. Your destructive behaviors, negative thought patterns or character flaws. Last week we looked at 1 John 1.8. John says, if we claim to be without sin, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, I'm pretty sure I underlined deceive on your sheet, but you want to circle it and you want, uh, and you want to star it. We deceive ourselves, right? Here is a principle of life. Sin always involves self-deception. Sin always involves self-deception. The moment I'm sinning, I'm deceiving myself because I think what I'm doing will actually produce better results than what God said. Let me say that again. Sin always involves self-deception. The moment I'm sinning, I'm deceiving myself because I think what I'm doing will actually produce better results than what God said. And we see this right at the very beginning of the story. Right at the very beginning, when Adam and Eve were deceived, did God really say... Adam and Eve deceived and they ate the fruit. We see it at the beginning. We see it all through the Bible. And we see it in our own lives too. So here's a fact of life. To stop defeating myself, I must stop deceiving myself. To stop defeating myself, I must stop deceiving myself. I've got to take an honest look at my life. Face the truth and deal with the issues. So let's just stop there and take a deep breath. And let me ask you, what are you pretending is not a problem in your life? What is it in your life that you're saying, oh, it's no big deal. I can stop any time. Or I act like this because... My dad acted like this. Let me give you an example of one, a relatively safe one. Take spending, for instance. There are some people who spend a lot of money uh, on things they don't need uh, to please people that they don't like, you know, that kind of thing. And often they'll say, well, it's just a little harmless indulgence, right? I like to shop. But if you're addicted to spending, or if you're in debt, or if you're using shopping to meet some other need, or to dull some other pain, to escape instead of facing a problem, remember those counterfeit affections we looked at last week, then it's not a harmless little indulgence. We can't get well 
And we can't be free until we stop denying and deceiving ourselves. We've got to acknowledge, first of all, that there's a problem, and then figure out what the root is. As I said last week, we need to be open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. How might he be convicting you this morning? Step two, believe that Jesus can transform you. You need to believe that Jesus can transform you. Romans 7.24, Paul asks, Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? Maybe you've thought something like that before. Maybe you've said something by that, like that before. Paul asks the question, who will free me from this life dominated by sin? And the great thing is he's not just calling this out because in verse 25, he proclaims, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The answer to our problem, whatever that problem is, is a person. It's Jesus. However, in order to experience Jesus' transformative work in our lives, We need to ask ourselves, who is going to be the Lord of my life? Who's going to be the manager? Who's going to have control and call the shots? Me or Jesus? See, only Jesus can set us free. And when we are mastered by the master, when we're mastered by Jesus, we can master our problems because he alone has the power. And only he can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Paul puts it this way in Romans 8.2. He says, For the new spiritual principle of life in Jesus Christ lifts me out of the old vicious cycle of sin. I love that. For the new spiritual principle of life in Jesus Christ lifts me out of the old vicious cycle of sin. The key to breaking the cycle of good intentions, failure, guilt, shame, good intentions, isn't a book or a seminar. It's getting the power of Jesus in our lives. And in order to do that, we need to believe that it's actually possible. We need to believe that Jesus can and will transform us. Because if we don't believe, it's not going to happen. That was step two, believe. Step number three, confess your struggle to another person. Confess your struggle to another person. James, the book of James, chapter 5, 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confession is a biblical principle of recovery. Confession is a prerequisite for forgiveness, for healing, for wholeness, for restoration. And God has wired us in such a way as Christian people that we need each other. That's what the church is all about, right? The church is not a hotel for perfect saints. Those people who march in and think they got it all together and they know their Bible and they're just the cat's meow. The church is a hospital hospital for sinners. If you're perfect, you don't need to be here. You can leave. This is a place for people who have admitted there is a war going on inside of me. But I believe that Jesus can make a difference in my life. And I am willing to humble myself and to admit when I make mistakes. I'm more interested in getting it together than pretending I've already got it together. See, confession is important because it brings what's hidden in the darkness out into the light. And in doing so, it disempowers it. And it weakens its control over us. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone go around the church this morning and share their secret sins. 
I'm not suggesting that. I don't even think that's what James is necessarily suggesting here in chapter 5. What I'm suggesting is every single person here finds someone. Someone you feel safe with. Someone you feel comfortable with. Someone that you trust. Someone that you can be accountable to. Your spouse, a close friend, a mentor, a mature believer, a professional, someone. And confess your struggle to them. Confess your destructive behaviors, your negative thought patterns, your character flaws. Not to create further shame or guilt. Not even to get their advice, because we don't want their advice. But simply to bring into them into light and to find encouragement in the midst of the battle. Remember 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I love the second part. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We cannot know the truth until we've confessed the lies and brought them into the open. And so I acknowledge the root of my problem. I believe that Jesus can transform me. I confess my struggle to another person. And finally, step number four, dedicate yourself completely to Christ. Dedicate yourself completely to Christ. Paul writes in Romans 6, 12, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to its lustful desires. Instead, give yourselves to completely to God, since you have been given a new life. Give yourselves completely to God, since you have been given a new life. Notice Paul uses the word completely here. He doesn't just say, you know, give yourself to God on Sundays or, or give, you know, your church life to God. He wants it all. Completely. In order to experience transformation and, and resurrection victory in our lives, especially when it comes again to the destructive behaviors, negative thought patterns, character flaws, we need a power that's greater than our own. And really, this is the first step in any 12-step program, isn't it? those of you who have been in 12-step programs, it is acknowledge your higher power. And Jesus is our higher power. Think about it this way. Every day we're controlled by something, whether we like it or not. You may be controlled by your own pride or ego. You may be controlled by your own desires or expectations or the expectations of others. You may be controlled by worry or fear or resentment or bitterness. You may be controlled by guilt or shame. You may be controlled by a substance or a habit or a thought pattern. We're all controlled by something. And freedom only comes when we make the right choice of who or what that will be. When we choose Jesus to be the controlling factor in our life, when we are mastered by the master, he gives us the power, his power, to master everything else. If God isn't number one in our lives, something else will be. And it will control us to a negative degree. But when Jesus is in control, he always moves us in the right direction. Yes, it might be slow. Yes, we might stumble and fall a hundred times, but he's still moving us by his grace in the right direction. And what does this complete commitment involve? Admitting that I've been trying to play God and that I can't change in my own. Humbly asking God to help being willing to be honest with someone else about the things that need changing in my life and giving Jesus total ownership. And what happens when we do this? 
Well, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God keeps his promise. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your power to resist. And at the time you are tempted, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. God keeps his promise. Dedicating ourselves to completely to Christ will give us the strength to stand firm in the midst of the battle. I think in our reading, Paul was acknowledging that uh, that although like a Rembrandt or a Monet or a Picasso, uh, like the Libyan Sibyl here, we are God's masterpiece. But like all works of art, we too can become damaged due to exposure to the world. Why do I do the things I don't want to do? Simple. Because I'm human and I'm sinful. And you are too. The question is, do I really want to change? Am I willing to position myself for change? If you've tried and tried and you failed, stop trying and start trusting. God gives us the choice to either depend on him or on ourselves. And the result is either freedom or frustration. So why not give it all to Jesus? I mean, you have nothing to lose. Our destructive behaviors, negative thought patterns, our character flaws do not have to control our lives. We don't have to settle for confusion and frustration and disappointment because through God's power and truth, he promises us victory. So might you need to be restored by the master in this area of your life? Let me just offer this prayer. I'm going to pray on your behalf. Lord Jesus, you know the things in our lives that we don't like. You know the things that are out of place, that are out of alignment with your word and your will, things that hurt us and you and the people in our lives. Things that we do, things that we say, things that we think. Things that we do to ease the pain and help to escape the stress and the problems of life. To find control. You also know, Lord, that we've tried to change on our own many, many, many times and we've failed. So this morning we admit that we are powerless to change. Lord, help us to know your truth, to know your power and your presence. This morning, we determined to make a fresh start, not based on trying, but on trusting. And so, Lord, we recommit ourselves to you. And we ask that through your power working in us, you would break the chains that bind us. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, deliver us from destructive behaviors, negative thought patterns, and character flaws. That we would know your perfect freedom. That we would live as a new creation. Lord Jesus, Master, Would you come and restore the masterpiece? That we might declare with the Apostle Paul, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.